Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Luca Cassetti. I am the Secretary General of E-Commerce Europe, uh, the European Digital Commerce Association. First, uh, let me start with a warm welcome to all our participants and, of course, the public who joined our conference on the role of e-commerce in bridging digitalization and sustainability. We really hope that you will find this discussion interesting and, of course, useful. So just a few words from my side to start. Um, E-Commerce Europe organized this event in the context of the work of our Sustainability Working Committee, which basically includes experts in this topic coming from all over Europe. Uh, today, we will have two panels. Uh, each of one will be followed by a Q&A session, and the moderator will ask a few questions, but we also invite the other speakers and, of course, the audience to ask their own questions via the chat box that you can find on the platform that we are using, which is Livestream. Uh, the first panel will be moderated by Mr. Christoph Wenk Fischer, CEO of the German E-Commerce Association, DVH, and member of E-Commerce Europe, while the second panel will be moderated by myself. Um, I would like now to give the floor to Mr. Weinand Jongen, who is the president of e-commerce Europe, who will deliver an opening speech and dive a little bit more in the topic of sustainability and e-commerce. So thank you very much all for being here with us today and enjoy the event. Weinand, the floor is yours. Weinand, can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. All right, this is better. Can everybody hear me? Great, well, welcome. Uh, thank you, Luca, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody to e-commerce Europe's uh, conference on sustainability and uh, e-commerce. And um, uh, seeing the number of people that have joined uh, today confirms that the issue is very high on everybody's uh, agenda and on everybody's mind. Um, earlier today, we had our board of directors meeting and our general assembly meeting. Um, 25 national associations all over Europe joining us and uh, setting course and strategy and, and stage for all the stuff that's happening in uh, Brussels. And that is really, really impacting um, our industry. And of course, today we did discuss aspects of a much bigger challenge, which is our contribution as a society to the fight against climate change and the transition to a more sustainable economy. The e-commerce understander, I think, has, has understood early on that the role it could play, it can play in this transformation is, is a huge one. And I dare to say that e-commerce as a sector really has become a front runner in this transition by bridging sustainability and digitalization. Today, this online conference, We'll explore uh, the different angles of the many questions that we have and the challenges that we uh, face. And of course, we hope that this conference will help you understand uh, what our e-commerce Europe drivers are behind this transition, and how we ultimately can help uh, make this a better world. And of course, make this a better world for both companies on the one hand and uh, consumers on the other hand. Now, to do that and to move forward, I do think we need a very constructive and fruitful uh, debate, well informed, uh, the right figures, the right um, uh, things to really put forward to the uh, people in the Brussels ar arena, uh, because I think uh, truly that um, uh, the, the right figures and well informed uh, people of the European Parliament is crucial for us to achieve. Ecomers Europe is proudly launching today its first edition of its collaborative report on sustainability and e-commerce. Um, it's a report where our members have shared studies and best practices and policy demands, uh, some facts and figures. And I think that report will be you know, working as an opening uh, a window for innovations and reflections uh, happening in our society. Um, today, in this conference, we'll get a first taste of the many upcoming discussions on those issues. Um, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to uh, watch and listen to the two panels. Um, and before handling the floor to my uh, colleague, Christoph Wenk Fischer, um, who is not only the director of the German e-commerce association, association BVH, but also chair of the e-commerce Europe um, uh, working committee on sustainability and e-commerce, I will leave you now, uh, wish you a wonderful afternoon, and I will leave you now with this short video. Enjoy the conference.
E-commerce has a pivotal role to play in today's society. Preserving our planet should drive every decision we make. The transition to a sustainable economy is both one of the greatest challenges and greatest opportunities we face. The e-commerce sector is a front-runner that can bridge digitalization and sustainability. Businesses all over Europe are spearheading tomorrow's sustainable solutions and shaping the way we shop online. From choosing the right partner, the way merchants package products, how these products are processed in distribution centers, to their delivery to your door, and to giving these products a second life. Sustainability needs to become the norm. Knowledge needs to be shared to contribute to better policy making. It's e-commerce Europe's priority to be the platform where innovative solutions are shared and encouraged. Together we can make a difference. Reach out to e-commerce Europe. So, hello everybody who joins. Um, let me start. My name is Christoph Fischer. Thank you for the introduction, dear Weinand. Nice to see you all in a digital world. Next time we meet personally, I hope so. But what is the main difference between e-commerce and the traditional way of doing commerce? I personally think it is the change from an offer-driven economy to a request-driven economy. What does that mean? It means that e-commerce optimizes the business processes to fulfill the consumer's needs instead of producing overstock by offering goods in the hope that they will be needed, which is often not the case like the Corona crisis shows. So let us talk about the role of the e-commerce value chain in the transition to a sustainable economy. Um, first, I want to introduce the participants of this first panel. Um, let's start with Walter Bartman, Director New Capacity at BOL.com. And second will be James Atkinson, Sustainability Program Manager at DPD. And then we will have Christoph Drowitz. Christoph, we already know each other. You are um, Business Development Manager at Germany at Repack. And then we will have Juliette Boulaton, public affairs advisor with a focus on sustainability at e-commerce Europe. So thank you for joining everybody. And let's start with Walter. Yes, Christoph. So thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Walter Bartman. I'm working for Bold.com as director of new capacity, and I have a focus on sustainability within Bold.com. So the coming minutes, I will give you some of the highlights of how Bold.com integrates sustainability in its core strategy and daily operations. You might not be familiar with Bold.com, so I will shortly introduce our company. Bold.com is market leader in e-commerce and the Netherlands, in the Netherlands and Belgium. We sell over approximately 23 million different products, and we have 4 million visitors on our website daily. And we have over 11 million active customers in the Netherlands and Belgium. We realized this with around 2,000 employees and 35,000 entrepreneurs selling their assortment through our platform. And of course, we have a lot of suppliers. At Bold.com, we believe that we are in the heart of society and that we have the opportunity to positively contribute to that in enabling a sustainable future for all of us because we believe that that is the new normal. And it's locked in our culture that we do this by improving every day, step by step. And to make this vision tangible, we set our own bar two and a half years ago. In 2025, shopping at Bold.com will be climate neutral. That means that we reduce our emission footprint to zero gram CO2 per parcel. Next to that, we will help all of our customers in making a conscious choice when buying something at Bold.com. And of course, sustainability is an all-purpose word. So I will elaborate on how to put this ambition into action when we started two and a half years ago. So how are we going to achieve that? And what do we prioritize? We divided our sustainability program into three pillars. 
logistics and environment, shops and assortment, and people and society. And with these three pillars, we think we cover a broad range of sustainability within our company. I will go through them all briefly. So when we look at logistics and environment, this is the pillar that directly impacts our CO2 footprint. Our goal is to reduce this footprint as much as possible. We think that we should be able to reduce this footprint with 60%, and we will compensate the rest in order to leave zero footprint. And the footprint is roughly caused by four drivers. We use packaging materials. Of course, we use energy in our buildings, our warehouses, and we deliver our parcels. And there is some, some rest container, which consists of all kinds of smaller impactors. And we start to look at our packaging material. So we have a lot of projects running to reduce the use of cardboard. For instance, we are sending some articles without a box. So this year we will do so for over 7 million parcels. And sending an article without a cardboard box, of course, reduces the cardboard. We also tried to reduce the thickness of the cardboard that we use. So we worked closely together with our packaging supplier and we enhanced the sturdiness of the cardboard and therefore we could reduce the thickness. What also, of course, reduces the amount that we use. We, also we are also using a lot of packaging machines. These machines pack our products automatically and we will grow from nine of these machines to 25 uh, the coming years. These packaging machines, they actually wrap the carton completely around the product and therefore we reduce the amount of air that's in the box. And that's very important because when you reduce the amount of air in, a, in the box, you can put more parcels into a trailer, into a delivery van, and so you reduce the amount of kilometers that a van drives per parcel. We also sometimes use plastic bags instead of cardboard. We specifically designed a plastic bag that is fully recycled and also eliminates the air around the parcel. And because of all these projects, we were able to reduce the use of filling materials with 75%, which is also, of course, a lot. So the next impactor that's uh, large is the use of energy in our distribution centers. We have switched all of our energy contracts to 100% Dutch solar and wind energy in this year. So we are completely green over there. And next to that, we have more than 100,000 square meters of roof on our distribution centers on which we have solar panels installed in order to also contribute to the amount of solar energy that is available in the Netherlands. When you then look at delivery, we already delivered 24% of all our parcels by bike and foot. For the other part, we are working closely together with all our distribution partners to make sure that they are also front runners on the use of electrical vans, hydrogen trailers, etc., etc. Actually, this is a very interesting area we, where we can still make a huge difference because we experience that there are not enough sustainable transportation options to fulfill the current demand. All of these projects resulted in a 13% decrease of the CO2 emission per package in the year 2019 in comparison to 2018. So we continue to continuously try to make it go down. The second pillar is shops and assortment. So our customers experience a couple of our logistical improvements when receiving our parcels. But we also, also want to inspire our customers to make a conscious choice in what product they buy. Therefore, Bold.com wants to become the starting point of sustainable shopping. We put this into practice by expanding our sustainable assortment and making sure that by 2022, in every single one of our over 10,000 shelves, we offer sustainable alternatives next to the more standard products. At this point, we offer a sustainable alternative in 30% of our shelves. We currently focus on the actual selling of the product. We also have a program running on how we can enable sustainable consuming even more. And we have gathered all of this sustainable assortment in a special sustainable shop and use filters and labels to make them recognizable for our customers. The last and the third pillar is people in society. The pillar is about the people that we work with and the society that we live in. Bold.com wants to be the growth accelerator for social entrepreneurs. 
We connect our social entrepreneurs to our platform and give them extra opportunities to tell their stories and to improve their sales on our platform. For instance, Dopper with their fantastic mission to fight the use of single use plastic bottles and also charity organizations get the opportunity to sell their merchandise on our platform against reduced cost. In this way, we try to support these social entrepreneurs with our strengths to make a greater impact on society. We also organize an impact day where all of our employees get the opportunity to spend a working day within a social organization to give something back to society. And we experience that hundreds of our colleagues really enjoy this. And the impact day is a very special occasion for both. So this is the way that we integrate sustainability in our strategy and daily execution. We feel that we already made some serious steps forward, but we also realize that there is an enormous challenge ahead of us. And to face this challenge, we, need, we will need to work very closely together within our company, with our customers and partners and throughout our whole supply chain. So is it working? We started a couple of years ago as a small group of sustainability-minded people within Bol.com. And with all the elements we have discussed previously, now we experience that sustainability has become an integrated strategy goal for the whole of Bull.com. So with this great tangible goal, shopping in 2025 will be climate neutral at Bull.com. This is my story. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Walter, for these insights and thank you for nearly keeping the time frame. Um, we have a very strict regime, so let's make it short. Next one will be James Atkinson. He's sustainability program manager at DPD. Hello. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is James Atkinson. I am the Sustainability Program Manager um, in DPD Ireland. Um, thank you very much, eCommerce Europe, for inviting me to speak today about how sustainability um, can help eCommerce to transition us uh, in the future. Uh, very relevant topic as so much to talk about uh, in sustainability through e-commerce like packaging like Wouter mentioned there also the customer experience emissions potential of circular economy and um, what to do with return so many things just a few days ago um, the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen um, proposing to increase our 2030 targets to a 55 percent reduction in carbon so um, Europe is on track to become the world's first climate neutral continent. So e-commerce is going to play a massive role in that. Um, so as uh, DPD, uh, as a leading parcel delivery company, we play a critical role of the e-commerce journey. Um, we're the first and last mile uh, part, and we are often one of the key touch points for a customer in the e-commerce experience. Um, so you're probably quite familiar with dpd um next slide please um dpd is the largest parcel delivery network in europe uh, we're part of le groupe la poste and every day our 77,000 delivery experts deliver about 5.3 million carbon neutral parcels and um, with huge capacity uh to increase that like 9.3 million parcels were delivered uh in cyber monday of 2019 across europe you may know us as dpd um, or Chronopost, Sour, or BRT. Uh, next slide, please. So to me, sustainability is all about future-proofing. Um, you're future-proofing against changing fuel prices, changes in customer expectations, and even against events this year, such as COVID-19. Um, sustainability strategy at DPD is done through our Driving Change platform. Um, driving change uh, sets the bold ambition to reduce our CO2 emissions per parcel by 30% by 2025. Um, to do this, we have to look closely at DPD's operations, our technology, and our strategy. And in a moment, I'll show you our electric depot here in Ireland. Uh, I'll present to you our air quality monitoring program and also highlight how investment in technology can improve our first-time delivery rates some some key figures so we've been carbon neutral since 2012 we do this through um an ambitious program of emissions reductions and offsetting and um, we have as of 2019 over 900 low emissions vehicles 
And this number is going to skyrocket uh, in the coming months and years as EVs and vans become more available. Um, in 2019, we tracked about 0.83 of a kilo CO2 per parcel. Um, and we're setting this to reduce to in 2025 by 30%. Next slide, please. So why sustainability? Um, why are we doing this? Well, uh, our e-barometer e report in 2019 showed us that 85% of our Epicurean e-buyers believe that companies must be environmentally responsible. So there's an increasing expectation amongst customers for companies to actually help them be responsible. Um, this is our uh, driving change uh, platform um, to help us in our responsibility to operate sustainably. Uh, we have four key pillars, um, carbon neutral commitment, smart urban delivery, closer communities, innovative entrepreneurship, all to maintain our position as an employer of choice. So I'm going to highlight some of the initiatives that we've been doing here in Ireland. Uh, next slide, please. And indeed in Europe. First of all, um, in 2019, we welcomed the Minister for Climate Action and Communications and Environment um, to Dublin to cut the ribbon on Ireland's first electric depot, um, which I think clearly shows DPD Ireland's ambition to uh, move into the low and no emissions vehicle space, um, an investment of 3.2 million euro. Now, to date, we've achieved about 80,000 parcels delivered by electric vehicle in Dublin city and we're hoping to expand this as part of our fleet decarbonization strategy. Next slide, please. Um, another uh, program that I want to tell you about is our air quality monitoring program. So with an increasingly urban population, our presence in cities becomes vital. Um, air quality is such a hot topic, especially uh, PM 2.5, which are these particles on the screen, about 20 times smaller than a human hair, a particularly damaging form of air pollution. Uh, next transition. So we've actually partnered with Polutrack. Um, so we've installed trackers on our fleet, on our vehicles and on our buildings in three major European cities. So last year we launched this in Madrid, Lisbon and Paris. Um, as you can see, we're going to be deploying them across Europe in the coming years. We share re real-time air pollution data with local authorities and city councils for free. Um, and we rolled this program out to other European cities in the coming years because information inspires action. Uh, next slide. Uh, finally, we make significant investments in technology to ensure first-time delivery success. And I think this is what we're talking about, the, the digitalization and sustainability aspect. So failed deliveries are bad for customer experience. They're, they put pressure on our operations and they ultimately result in delivery vans making unnecessary journeys, which can add to a parcel's carbon footprint. So we want to reduce that. Um, we offer an industry-leading predict service. So as you can see on the screen, this is a text I got giving me a one-hour time window of when my parcel will arrive and an option to change the time and uh, delivery location. We also have an award-winning app, Parcel Wizard. It's a one-stop shop to schedule your parcels, change the delivery address, or arrange a return via the DPD pickup network. Um, and our pickup network is a network of 46,000 parcel shops and lockers. Um, these are late opening hour shops, uh, which make it more convenient that the uh, recipient of the parcel can, can, can tell us to deliver it to a pickup shop. Um, Europeans are never more than 15 minutes away from a pickup location. So it's extremely convenient for the customer, uh, but it also has the added benefit of driving footfall to local shops which may not otherwise get those extra visitors. So in conclusion, this technology uh, investment allows us to deliver industry-leading uh, delivery experience, reduce unnecessary journeys, and drive sustainability in e-commerce. Our investment in low and no emissions vehicles, especially electric vehicles, will continue to mean that DPD vans are welcome in cities and are a leading partner in the sustainable e-commerce value chain. Thank you. Thanks a lot to you, James. Um, we had first the insights from the merchant, now from the transportation company, and the next one will be a packaging solution. Christoph, it's your next eight minutes. The presentation, please. Yeah, okay. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm Christoph Trovitz. I work for Repack, and our claim is that the end of trash, or better to say, 
packaging trash is near. So um, next slide, please. Um, we probably don't need to talk about this movement that has um, emerged in, in all over the world in the past years now with a little break um, due, uh, due to the corona virus, but I'm very confident that this movement will come back right after uh, we have more or less um, got beyond this, this corona crisis at the moment, that we have at the moment. Next one, please. Um, we're talking about trash and all these young people, especially they're, they are, they're demanding something from the businesses all over the world. And we're talking about trash now and um, especially in e-commerce, uh, which is still on a steady rise. Um, we cannot expect that um, e-commerce is, um, the, the volume of e-commerce is, 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 um, is falling. It's, it will be right the, the opposite. And especially if we look at emerging markets like India and so on, um, that, is, that are not that saturated um, yet, like uh, like Germany or the Western Europe. We don't need to look into the exact numbers, but uh, we know that uh, that packaging trash is is getting more and not less at the moment. Next, next. Um, at the same time, uh, of course, we cannot um, assume that uh, we can get rid of. Oops. Last, that was one too too too, too far. Um, we we cannot expect that uh, we get rid of uh, packaging uh, of the packaging um, completely. We still need packagings to protect the goods, and at the same time, it's the number one customer touch point. It's the business card of business um, um, of of the of the retailer. Next, so we um, invented and introduced a returnable and a reusable packaging system. We call it reuse as a service. Um, when, and this consists of three elements. That is a reusable packaging um, retailers can ship to their consumers. This packaging can be used up to oh, at least 20 times um, um, and um, saves a lot of trash just by being reused. But of course, that's not the only thing that is needed to, to have such a service because um, the key element is actually to get these packagings back somehow, uh, to get them back from the consumers so that they can be reused. So we introduced also a global return system uh, that enables consumers to, to return them from all over the world. And finally, um, there's a re we put in a reward system or an incentive system that incentivizes in the, um, the consumers to do so, actually. Next. So um, we don't, again, we don't need to look into the exact numbers, but um, you can just see by this illustration, um, one repack um, is uh, potentially able to substitute 20 cardboard boxes. So if you just look at the amount of trash, that would mean three kilograms of cardboard against 118 grams of, of um, recycled, already recycled propylene. And um, also the CO2 balance is, um, speaks for itself. Um, it is, um, this is just an example, but it can be uh, reduced by up to 80%, depending on what the alternative packaging, of course, is. Next one, please. So this is how the, um, the repacks look like. It's bags um, that, that are made from uh, recycled polypropylene. They are adjustable in size, so you don't ship air. They, um, they go from zero liters up to 45 liters. That's pretty big already. You can big, put really winter jackets into it. And into the small ones, you can ship really small goods like underwear or jewelry or something like that. And they're very durable, waterproof, and so on. And of course, in bags, they are more suitable for fashion products more than like heavy stuff or uh, porcelain or something like that, for ex um, of course. Next one, please. So how does it work? Typically, um, web shops that are using the repack system are offering uh, repack as an option in their checkout processes. This is an example from the avocado store in, in Germany. There, uh, they have a little text. Uh, do you, and they are asking, do you want to have your next shipment in a reusable um, shipping uh, container? Yes, uh, that makes 
three and ninety five extra, but we will re reward you after you returned it with a ten percent voucher. Next one, please. So that means the um, the consumer has the full fully con full control and has the choice about using it. So this is how it looks when it's been shipped. So it's been sealed with a piece of tape and then um, with a shipping label on top of, on, on top of it. Next one, please. This is how it looks when you receive it. You just get your goods out. Next. And finally, when you keep the goods, then you just fold the repack into letter size and um, let drop it into any post box in the world. That works really in Germany and, and France and uh, in, in Scandinavia or even on Fiji islands. Of course, it doesn't make sense to ship it there, but um, theoretically it works. And you, the only thing the consumer needs to do is let this little hang tag uh, hang out, which is the postal label, which is prepaid already. Next one, please. So, and, and after that, um, when we receive the repack back into our central logistics center, then uh, an email is being triggered Thanks for returning me. And here is a link to our marketplace where you can pick a voucher at any shop of the Repack universe you like. And any shop is um, presenting their individual offering there. That's typically 10% or 10 euro vouchers. Next one, please. So you see, uh, we have a truly circular solution. Uh, instead of um, creating boxes and pouches and uh, throwing them, them away or in the best case putting them to recycling we, we we receive them back clean them maintain them and restack them into boxes of, of 100 and redistribute them to the web shops where they can be reused as often as until they break and um, that is typically not before the 20th time next one please so um, we already have um, around 100 customers in 15 countries. Uh, we're proud to say that um, not only the very sustainable um, players um, or niche players um, where Repack started with um, are among our customers, but now also more mainstream brands have joined us um, or are at least uh, making trials with Repack because they um, see their responsibility as well. And we need to find out how we get that into the market. Next one, please. So what does it need to establish circular packaging in e-commerce and not to just establishing it, but establishing it broadly? The first of all is uh, it does not only need the web shop that introduces Repack. Um, but it also needs educated consumers. So it does not help to just ship all the packagings out and the consumers don't know what to do with them and overlook it. They simply throw them away because they are just not aware. Next one. So next one is uh, we need scaling in order to reduce the costs. Any reusable system needs scaling. Uh, we need to gain visibility. Uh, we need to enable a maybe a new return infrastructure, which is not there. The postal system is good, but it's expensive. So that is also the difference to a bottle return system that basically has no um, no costs for, um, you, because you, you bring your bottles to the supermarket on foot and it doesn't cost you um, anything this way to the supermarket. And if we want to um, make have new consumer habits in the market, We there needs to be some kind of market standard and that needs the scaling as well. Next one. We need uh, mainstream players in addition to all these ecological niche players. We call them ecological mainstream pioneers. So the pioneers among, among the mainstream players that take the responsibility and want to try something out. Among all these players that really want to join this movement and develop something bigger, there, where, there we need cooperation and not competition. So we experienced that already, that people or web shops are talking with each, with each other and, and are cooperating um, to, um, 
to get these uh, these things done. And finally, we also re need regulatory and political measures to establish and promote circular packaging, because the uh, political environment or the um, regulative environment is not yet there to um, really to nudge the people or to um, to um, to give incentives to uh, to go into this topic. Next one, please. So in Germany, we have a, um, a research project we are very proud of being part of, uh, be, being part of, which is called Praxpark, where exactly this happens already. We have the Otto Group, we have Chibu, we have Avocado Store um, as pra practice partners, and um, we are doing research on what needs to be done, what, how do the, all these mechanisms. Um, work out how how does the packaging need to develop? What about the logistic providers? Because there are so many stakeholders in this uh, in this re reusable packaging, uh, much more than uh, in single use packaging. And um, we are um, this is a very very good chance and opportunity to um, to uh, to shape to shape the future to make this real for the for the for the broad. Um, e e mainstream e-commerce and a follow-up project is also already on the way which is exactly development of measures to establish and promote general shipping packaging systems so uh, where recommendations being given to, to policy makers how to make regulations and laws and um, and, and promotions um, to establish exactly that um, yeah Christoph, thank you very much I <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> I have to. Thanks a lot for this presentation of a waste avoiding solution. But now mm -hmm. let's come to the next part. And this is Juliette. Juliette, please, can you give us a short introduction? What does the e-commerce association of Europe do in the field of sustainability? Please. Thank you very much, Christoph, for uh, giving me the floor. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll be brief because I also want to leave some time for questions. Uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing your views from the audience as well. But uh, thank you very much, Christoph, for the transition because uh, the study you just mentioned is one of the example of uh, the kind of work e-commerce Europe is trying to put up at European level. So when we decided to establish our sustainability working committee at the beginning of the year, it was exactly to hear stories like the one we just heard today. So we wanted to hear from the business uh, what is the e-commerce uh, supply chain actually about when it comes to sustainability, because there's a lot of uh, myth, there's a lot of perception issues, there's a lot of discussion around e-commerce, and sometimes uh, we feel like there's a need to bridge uh, the, the, maybe the gap of knowledge and the, the misperception sometimes of the impact of e-commerce and compared to the actual solutions that are being placed on the market uh, by actors. Uh, from uh, We're lucky to see today from the packaging to the transport to uh, retailers also connecting those dots um, together. Um, my colleague will post uh, just now actually in the chat the link to our collaborative report on e-commerce and sustainability, which is our first edition uh, and also a first attempt to collect from our members as many examples and studies as possible in order to be able to communicate a lot better to consumers and policymakers about uh, what the e-commerce industry is doing and also striving to do. Um, because I think that the, I'm looking at uh, some of the topics that you mentioned, and those are the topics that are driving our work. So cooperation between partners, how do we make exchange of information, best practices and data, which is very important between uh, packaging, you know, uh, the packaging sector, so it fits into trucks, so it serves the demand of the retailer and gets to the end of the consumer uh, and gives consumers also the opportunity to make choices uh, the most sustainable possible. Um, also, of course, uh, you mentioned very well awareness and education, which is also something we strive for. And also, uh, how do we upscale? So how do we take these opportunities to make them um, bigger? Because I think something uh, you mentioned, James, is that we're going to see uh, if under the right condition, we can see an exponential 
growth of the sustainable solution. So what we strive to do as e-commerce Europe, and we'll be able to talk about this a bit later today, so I'll give the floor to uh, questions, um, but we strive to connect people like you participating to the panel and attending the conference in order to bring forward those solutions already in the market and make sure that you know we can talk about sustainability with all the facts and data and uh, examples that we can to have a good and productive debate at European level. But I'll leave it here. And of course, we're available uh, to answer questions later during the conference as well. Thanks a lot, Juliet. So we heard a lot about the companies um, investing in sustainability. We heard about e-commerce Europe, what we are doing there. But e-commerce is not just algorithms or company. It's not just processes, it's people's business. So let's start our discussion with a very private question. Um, it's maybe an expected one, but if you ask, answer in a private way, it would help us to come into a discussion. So let me ask you how and why do you personally care for sustainability? And the second step, how and why does this fit to your business and your role within? So please, first your personal view, not the view of your company. Why are you engaged in sustainability personally and how? And let's start with Juliette, because she was the last one. Now she has to be the first. I'll keep it very short with a very cliche answer. Um, I'm a very young millennial. So I was born in the mid 90s uh, where it's sort of we were born with the idea that there's no other way. So as a consumer um, and bringing into politics, so it's a very personal choice I think we make uh, as well. Um, and I see that, you know, having companies uh, putting forward the solution that we need uh, to be more active consumers is very important. But I think we're a generation that's very aware that we have a role to play in, in this as well as individuals. Well, I'll keep it short for that. That's <laughs> Thanks a lot, Juliet. Now, Christoph, it's your turn, and we already have a question to you. But first, what about sustainability in your private life? Yeah, um, there was a time when I, I, I must say, uh, woke up, I would say, um, that came along with my meditation and yoga practice, uh, probably, um, where I just let all this destruction of the world really touch my heart. And uh, when I did not block it, way anymore and after that it was like a change um, it was a transition phase but i really don't want to waste my time anymore on things that distract or that propel the destruction of the world anymore it's just i, I cannot do it anymore <laughs> thank you for this answer and now a special question to repack from isabel weisbecker question um, what would you need to make the system work more easily or more widely in europe Oh yeah, that is a um, good question. Um, I mean, we have a, we have a system that works, and we are very proud proud of. And you can start with it like within a week. Uh, you could start repacking, but it depends on your assortment, what you're selling. Uh, if it's mixed assortment, uh, fashion and uh, other stuff that cannot be packed in a repack, you need some rules when to offer in what cases you offer a repack, uh, and. So there's some logistic questions and some, um, but also price questions. Um, we need, to, we, we know that we need to reduce the returning price um, to a certain degree that it's also price-wise compatible, um, competitive with single-use packaging, which is like, costs literally nothing. Huh? And um, so that is the silver bullet, we call it internally, having um, very well, re significantly reduced return prices or return costs. That is the main main driver, actually. That would enable a lot of other things, but that is probably the case, the main issue. So this point is to be addressed to the postal service suppliers, more or less. Your yeah, postal or also the parcel networks as well. It does not mean that we only need to rely on the postal, on the letter systems, but also on the parcel systems. Thank you for that. And now we come to James. Um, are you living in a sustainable household? How do you care about sustainability? 
Um, I'm proud to say we are living in a sustainable household as, as, as best we can be. Um, we're buying our electricity from renewable sources and uh, doing a meat-free Wednesday. Um, it really is the gap between the aspiration. Sorry to interrupt you. We have a bad connection. You are muted sometimes. Yeah, well, I'm glad to say we are. It's um, sorry. Okay, better. Is that okay now? Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, no, I'm glad to say we are living in a sustainable household uh, as as much as we can be, uh, and it's just small things like like Juliet says, like like a typical millennial, you know, meat free Wednesday, um, trying to switch to an electric uh, supplier that's renewable. 100% uh, renewable, um, and other steps like that to reduce our water as well. Thanks a lot. And now, Walter, um, your presentation was made by yourself. It sounded to come from your heart. So please, how do you live privately in the field of sustainability? Yeah, so we have three kids. So um, we, of course, try to, to make our lives as sustainable as possible because they are uh, going to live uh, longer in this world than we are. And I think that maybe for me, it drives me the most on, uh, I'll make the best of, uh, of the sustainable living that you can do. Driving an electrical car, uh, uh, my, uh, my girlfriend uh, never wants the heater up more than 19 uh, degrees, stuff like that. So yeah, we just try to make the most of it. Thanks a lot. Um why did I ask this? I ask this because I think e-commerce is real people's business and people are talking about sustainability and that means that we are not doing greenwashing. We are blamed sometimes for that, but I think it's our personal behavior which counts and that's something which is as important as the company's um, attempts to get more sustainability. So thank you for this, but is this fashion or is it a real sustainable fashion? Um, May I ask this into the panel? How long will it last, the sustainability? Um, I'm the only one not muted, so I take the <laughs> I take it now the question. Um, I, I think it will be a sustainable development. Um, as I said, the Fridays for Future um, uh, movement and um, also you, um, Juliette, you, you are a millennial, you are grown into this this movement somehow. It, it, it has a pause at the moment because Corona is taking all the attention at the moment and it will probably also take the most of the attention for at least half of the next year, but it will come back. I'm very, very confident. And I've seen that um, these companies like Otto and Chivo that are family companies, family owned, they are taking responsibility and we are getting um, inquiries from companies all over the world now. And um, that is that started basically in 2019 with this Fridays for Future movement. Although we, ha we had contacted them years before already, but 19, it, everything came, came back. Before that, oh, nice idea, but not the right time. Now it's the time. Yeah, I think from a Bob.com point of view, we, we would say the same. I mean, uh, what we see in our in our company, the, the colleagues that we have, the average age is around 34. And they're in our uh, periodical uh, uh, motivational uh, research, we we see an, in, an increase of of commitment to the fact that we as a Bob.com have, have our own strategy on sustainability. And that's only for the, the people that work at our uh, at our place, but also our customers. They're also increasing in having a, a commitment on the topic of sustainability and it's rising really fast. It's, it's rising to maybe it's more than 60% at this moment. So it's an, I think it's a movement that will never stop and will only uh, uh, goes faster. Yeah, um, I, th I think one of the areas of sustainability is that we often use the number, the number 2050. So people think, well, it's not for another 30 years. I've got plenty of time. But with the dramatic climate events that we've seen this year, Californian wildfires, um, uh, 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 flooding, all, all these dramatic events, it's suddenly more real and it's suddenly not so far away. 
um, which is people are starting to wake up. They're saying this is the only reason that the, um, these events are happening. It must be to do with global warming and we must do something fast. And that's putting pressure on governments. And now we're, we're seeing the, the change starting to happen. Maybe just uh, to, to jump on, uh, I think it's a long-term trend also because it's cemented during the COVID crisis. So we could have expected that something fashionable would have disappeared from our mind, but it's actually quite the opposite in a way that suddenly we were all the more connected to our local communities, all the more uh, connected to our health as well. Because James, you mentioned rightly, you know, the importance of, uh, because it's not just, it is, the environment but it's also people's health it's also a question of accessibility of inclusivity so i think the sustainability um today we're discussing sustainability for an angle of you know climate change and sustainable practices but it's also a question of uh, how are we sustainable as a society uh in terms of how do we make uh product available more accessibly? How do we make sure that we have a digitalized and sustainable, uh, inclusive society, uh, a society where people can be healthy? Um, so I think it, the, the challenge is now is so big that there's, uh, there's no turning back. So uh, yeah, I think we're here for the long run. <laughs> this is good. Thank you. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to ask all the questions I have to the panel. So let's come to our closing round here and that's very important for me too because my question is my last question is how can we get the smes on the track to sustainability that's very important for us because um, dpd is a very big company bol.com is a very big company and otto chibo they are the big ones and all these companies do care for sustainability but there are lots of small and medium-sized enterprises what can we do what can we all do to help them on the tracks to more sustainability who wants to start maybe you Walter? okay yes so what we what the way we started is that we um that we looked for knowledge in the market so we hired an external uh, firm to analyze our impact uh, throughout our whole supply chain to get advice on where to start. And it gives you, I think, uh, both uh, two advantages. So the first thing is that you get some sort of objective uh, analysis of on where you're making impact, but you also uh, retrieve directly all the, the knowledge that also are already there in the market. So then you can really uh, uh, gain some speed in knowing where to start and also where you can make the first uh, and the best impact. So, and, and I think that's the start where you need to start because you just have have a, a starting point. And then what we do at Bold.com, we just try to do it better from that uh, uh, position on. Thank you, James. Short answer, please. Um, I think if, if I have to give a, a single answer to that great question, it's uh, to make the tech uh, a more accessible platform to SMEs. You have to make it super easy for you to fulfill their delivery needs, uh, bearing in mind that some of them may be new in the e-commerce space. Um, so it's all about investing in the technology. Okay. Yes, um, in our case, um, I would say the same. The big ones, they are, um, we, we need the big ones, the real big ones to scale the things up and, um, um, and, and create a standard. And the SMEs, the smaller ones, need, they need quick, quick solutions like plugins, like where they don't need to invest and um, examine things. And um, it needs to be easy to, um, to, to put through and to, to integrate. Uh, I'll say something that's going to eat a bit on the second panel, but I would say harmonization. And it's not just sustainability, but harmonization of European legislation uh, to make it easier for companies to navigate and scale up as well uh, beyond one country's border uh, is quite important, at least from e-commerce Europe perspective. Thanks a lot to my participants. And um, maybe I can involve now because we're on time. Another participant, he posed a question that's Wynand himself. Do you want to ask yourself or shall I read it? 
I think Vinen is not on stage anymore, so I'm not sure he can join okay. us uh, uh, live, so unfortunately. <laughs> so what about perception in the market that e-commerce is to blame for all that is wrong in our inner cities, whereas research shows that e-commerce is only responsible for 5% of all CO2? Well, that's not a question, that's a statement, I think. Um, I think that e-commerce can have and fulfill the lighthouse function for the whole economy. Why? Because we try to always get better processes. We try to avoid everything which re causes costs and costs are something which is strongly related to environment and to sustainability as well. So I'm very happy to hear from all of you from the merchants perspective. Thank you, Walter, from the transportation companies. Thank you to James and the packaging. Thank you to Christoph and the political side. Thank you to Juliette that we are hardly working on this. So um, we are nearly on time. I can see Luca now and I give back the word to Luca. Thank you to everybody for participating on this panel. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Any pressure, of course, on you. Uh, you just joined the stage in time. Uh, so a warm thank you indeed to all the speakers of the first panel for the rich examples and best pra practices that have been presented. Uh, of course, hearing directly from businesses about some of the innovations and, and, and best practices that we are seeing on the ground raises a few questions. So how can we take this to the next level? How can we further unlock the sector's potential? And of course, what can be the role of policy making, policy making in this sense? We are now seeing the ambition of the European Green Deal uh, and the Circular Economy Action Plan concretizing. Legislative and non-legislative initiatives and reports are now soon expected to be published or approved in the coming months on green claims, the role of consumers, but also packaging, sustainable products, or even smart and sustainable mobility. Uh, we will try to explore some aspects of these various policy developments and try to identify some of the key elements of a successful framework. And to do that, we will dive into this topic with our four panelists. Firstly, uh, welcome to Ms. Rosalina Petrova, member of the cabinet of Commissioner Virginius Sinkevichus, in charge, among other things, of the Circular Economy Action Plan. And we will have also Ms. Arba Kokalari, member of the European Parliament and EPP shadow rapporteur on the initiative report uh, titled Towards a More Sustainable Single Market for Business and Consumers. We will also have Ms. Charlotte Sheina, Senior EU Affairs Manager at eBay. And finally, Christoph, who you already know because he was the moderator of the first panel. Uh, I will leave the floor to each speaker, and we will, of course, have some time for questions afterwards, either from the audience or also from other speakers. And I would like to begin with Ms. Petrova from the European Commission. Welcome. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, to this discussion. I already joined uh, the first panel. Uh, it was uh, amazing what we heard, the solutions, and uh, also the way how e-commerce uh, approaches uh, the challenges. Uh, so whenever we start a presentation these days, we, we start talking about the, the crisis, the coronavirus crisis, and uh, the serious implications uh, that this has had on uh, uh, our economy, on our lives and uh, on, on specific sectors. Uh, uh, here the picture is quite reversed than what uh, we are normally talking about because actually the e-commerce has grown during these times and uh, that is why it also makes it uh, so important uh, to act uh, now on the sustainability of e-commerce because uh, it's uh, indeed uh, an activity, a sector that, that would continue growing and uh, it's very important to get it right. Uh, uh, it, it's not from the start uh, because uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, there is already sizable e-commerce going on, but uh, it's uh, now about the right moment to start thinking about those sustainability solutions. And uh, uh, in the current crisis, before that and after, uh, the Commission has confirmed that uh, our uh, European Green Deal is our growth strategy and uh, that the twin green and digital transition uh, uh, is the way to go. It's uh, uh, that we have to explore also the, the synergies and uh, e-commerce indeed uh, represents one of uh, those areas where, where the, the synergies are most evident and uh, where a lot can be 
achieved uh, in uh, our goals to become first uh, climate neutral continent uh, but also in uh, uh, many other aspects of uh, sustainability environmental sustainability waste reduction pollution air pollution reduction so all this environmental um, uh, goals uh, have uh, we have something to say about them and uh, also um, uh, uh, in in the future we see more and more the the, the role of uh, also of e-commerce together of course with with other traders in uh, 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 the, the the compliance with which you rules because of course uh, also on products uh, and this is would be a major uh, issue in the future if we have all the sustainability requirements on our products how actually to achieve compliance all these issues are tackled uh, in our new circular economy action plan which aims on one hand uh, to make sustainable products the norm and uh, uh, then also to act on some specific in some specific areas uh, many of which were mentioned here so uh, first indeed uh, there will be sustainability requirements from electronics uh, to batteries uh, to textiles to many other products and uh, we also are going to uh, um, uh, have action on packaging. So packaging is indeed an area that was mentioned a number of times during the previous panel and it's very important because uh, indeed we reached the highest point since measurement so basically for 2017 where is the latest data at EU level uh, we have exceeded 170 kilograms per person per year in the EU which is which is the highest level since measurement started and, and uh, uh, that is something uh, that uh, is uh, unsustainable development and we would like to see that uh, the only way for packaging waste uh, generation is serious I have to contribute uh, to, to this goal and uh, I'm uh, quite uh, hopeful when I hear the solutions uh, that are possible and uh, indeed uh, as, as presented it's essential to ensure that this reversed logistics actually happens that uh, indeed uh, 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 the one way which business is now used to is quite organized so business to consumer is, is quite well going on but the challenge is indeed uh, how to, to close the circle so how to make uh, uh, the flows back from uh, from consumer to, to businesses and then next to that of course uh, we would support a lot of other renew uh, reuse initiatives uh, and we would work indeed uh, to see more and more um, uh, repair also that products are repairable and here again uh, uh, in particular when it comes to imported products in many cases it's it's those uh, entities uh, the platforms uh, that that are the key point between let's say in a product and, and, and a consumer and uh, uh, we can uh, indeed we see more and more that uh, uh, the pressure uh, there increases in particular when we talk about uh, indeed this reverse logistics and uh, these are all uh, um, challenges that we have to uh, cope with and, and have to address, not only cope with, but, but address in the best possible way. Uh, because even when we talk about uh, extended producer responsibility for packaging, for instance, this is again something that uh, uh, is very important where we would like to see the full participation of the e-commerce uh, uh, sector in, in the future. So uh, I think that I will stop here. There are a lot of interesting and uh, um, exciting uh, developments, both in, uh, let's say, the business world and in the policy world. And uh, I think that it's very important that we make both this word towards me so that we can find those most optimal solutions that would really make uh, a change uh, for better sustainability in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Petrova, for starting the panel. I would like to give the floor to Ms. Kokalari, member of the European Parliament from the EPP party. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I would also like to thank you for organizing this event and for uh, inviting me to, um, to this um, session. I overheard uh, a bit from the last panel when they asked, is, uh, uh, is, this, uh, is sustainability a trend or is this a reality? I would say this is the beginning of the reality that will be 
uh, our our life uh, in the future. I mean, uh, if we don't make this transition, then we will have less companies who sell products to consumers. We will have a, a very bad climate uh, that will, you know, be unlivable, of course. And I think it's in everybody's interest to make sure that also um, the market is a part of this transition. I'm very happy that there is a strong engagement from the business community to make this transition. I would like to say that many times it's not only the demand from, uh, from the consumers to make uh, more sustainable choices that is important, but it's also a big factor that we see that industries, startups, it's innovation that will drive this development to a more a green and circular economy. I'm um, uh, negotiating right now a report uh, in the internal uh, market committee in the European Parliament, uh, which touches uh, of how we can make uh, the internal market more sustainable. And I would like to concentrate this beginning of my remark to say, First, uh, the three factors I think are crucial to make the internal market more sustainable and circular. And then I would like to uh, present you the four ideas that I'm, uh, I think are very important to implement so we can have a, a more sustainable uh, internal market. So the three important factors I think are necessary uh, for a circular economy is first to have a close collaboration between all relevant stakeholders. It's important to listen to consumer organizations, but it's also very crucial to listen to the business community uh, and, um, and to also understand that we cannot, when we're trying to harmonize legislation within the EU, we also have to make sure that we have a sector specific legislation. We cannot legislate um, on sustainability on furnitures at the same way as we do on um, uh, home appliances, for example. It takes different kind of legislations. I think that um, many of the companies, uh, at least in my country, in Sweden, are in the forefront of sustainability. We have to make it easy for companies to do this transition, not lay only burdens on them. Because I see today that there are many of my politician uh, fellows in the European Parliament who like to uh, play uh, scientists, they like to play product designers and CEOs. But we have to make good legislation and not, um, not too bureaucratic legislation that makes this development contraproductive. Um, the second important thing is that international trade, new technology and economic growth is a condition for a circular economy. And um, it has to become more easier and more, uh, uh, more profitable uh, to do this transition. Otherwise, we will never convince uh, the big polluters in China and in the US that uh, the green, green transition together with uh, growth is possible. And one very good example that was mentioned by Ursula von der Leyen in her big speech last week was the Swedish hybrid project, which is a collaboration between three big companies and politicians and academia. So they have developed the first, uh, a new technology that produces fossil free steel. Before this was, people thought this would be impossible. Now, now this is a reality. Uh, that's fantastic. And the third thing is that we need to have a well functioning internal market. We have too much barriers still in the internal market that hinders the sustainable um, transition. So I have four suggestions that I think would uh, increase uh, the ability to uh, adapt to a circular economy. The first one is that we need to have a single market for waste within the union. Uh, still, I mean, it's very difficult to uh, sell and to export uh, secondary materials within the European Union. Companies want to have um, um, 
so-called waste so they can uh, reproduce them to new products but if you don't have access to uh, plas different plastics or um or, or if there are like uh, 27 different regulations on waste within the EU, or if the enforcement of the EU legislations are not there, then it's very difficult to make this transition. Secondly, we have to enable easy repairs, leasing and sustainable services. Uh, I think that one thing the European Union can do is to uh, uh, make sure that we have a, a function market for services, so we can enable and encourage more of sharing economy. So consumers can start uh, not buying product, but lease more products. That's a business opportunity for companies, but it also makes sure that we have less emissions if uh, consumers can lease uh, products. Thirdly, uh, we have to make more sustainable choices uh, for consumers. Today, there is a jungle of information there are uh, information, green claims, different sustainability labels, and it's very, very difficult as a consumer to understand what you really buy if you want to make a greener, sustainable choice. And it's also difficult for companies to um, to sell a product when there are so many uh, different uh, labels. So we have to collaborate with the business sector and to have a more sustainable, harmonized uh, labelings. Um, and fourth, uh, we have to uh, have more green and sustainable trade of products, both uh, make sure that the EU is on the forefront to make sure that we have a global green free trade agreement. Uh, but also that the EU itself uh, removes tariffs of goods and services that contributes to less emissions, but also to make sure that the influx of products within the EU that are not living up to our high standards of uh, chemicals, environment, uh, environments and so on, that we have a better market surveillance. I think if we do all of these four things, that would really accelerate the development uh, towards a circular economy. But uh, sometimes I feel very alone of saying this because many of my colleagues in the European Parliament think it's better to exactly regulate how many days um, uh, you as a consumer have, have to get access to a, a repaired products or they are some of them are more interested to ban advertising and uh, sort of confiscate intellectual property rights. And I think we cannot destroy the market if we want to have a circular economy. We have to bring the market with us. Otherwise, I'm afraid that we will not accomplish and to and accomplish the climate goals and to make sure that the EU is really on the forefront globally towards the green transition. Thank you very much, Ms. Kokalari, for your insights. I would like to hand over the floor to uh, Charlotte from eBay uh, for a, a little bit more uh, of a business perspective. Charlotte, the, Charlotte, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, thanks again for e-commerce Europe for this opportunity to, to speak and uh, very interesting uh, interventions so far. So I hope I will um, bring um, some more uh, added uh, value from the, the, the business perspective um, uh, to this panel. Uh, maybe just first of all to, to mention that um, it feels uh, very natural and, and no pun intended uh, for eBay to speak on uh, sustainable issues. For, for 25 years eBay has existed to uh, enable consumers and businesses to give second life to goods. Uh, first of all, by enabling exchanges of secondhand goods between individuals. Uh, and now we see also growing opportunities for more sustainable um, trade uh, also among um, businesses and so in, in the business to consumer uh, sphere, such as through the growth of um, and the ever growing also demand by consumers of refurbished items, uh, repurposed items, eco designed items. Um, and things like that. And so I think especially in the eve of uh, COVID-19 recovery, it is important to create a framework 
um, that will enable the SMEs, which are the majority of the of the sellers selling now on eBay, small businesses, micro businesses, to enable them through a favorable framework to seize these new opportunities for sustainable trade, because this will both meet the demand, um, which is growing from consumers and will also help them uh, grow. And especially, as I said, in the, in the eve of, of the crisis uh, recovery. And so in order to do that, I wanted to share a few also ideas that um, at eBay would like to share to so policy me measures, right, to make this more favorable uh, framework that I was uh, talking about. And we, we come to, we come from a point of view uh, to this debate from a point of view of, uh, well, a particular actor, right, in the value chain. So we're not, we're not a producer of products. Uh, we're not a seller of products ourselves. And so we hope that the, the ideas that we bring to the table will also bring this added perspective um, to the debate. And maybe to start off also by saying that um, what SMEs need is legal certainty and stability. I'm sure this uh, this is familiar with um, uh, all the people attending here today. This is a an idea that um, the majority will support, right? Uh, and there were many changes already recently, for example, in consumer law that um, SMEs have to still adapt um, to. And so we be, we believe from eBay that we have to believe to behave cautiously in uh, bringing more changes, but still that some key adjustments might enable these this new potential that I was um, talking about. And so just to mention the few ideas that we've had, and some of them have been raised actually by the previous speakers, so uh, they will sound familiar. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned before was about um, product information or sustainable sustainability related information, let's say. And uh, we totally agree with what's been mentioned before that in the area we see a need for uh, creating a more streamlined and harmonized uh, way of sharing the inf this, what is very important uh, information nowadays for the consumer, but it, it will, in our view, it will also enable SMEs to share that information a lot better if we just make it easier for them also to implement. Um, and one, you know, one big example is today, about two thirds of the traffic going through eBay uh, is on mobile, on mobile devices. And so one important thing related to the, the labeling um, requirements is that it may fit on any devices that the consumers use and still make the information quite readable. And we believe that's important. Obviously, European harmonization in, in the field is also important. Um, a second idea that I wanted to mention was this idea of protecting SMEs um, in, in the role that they have in the value chain, especially with regards to the manufacturer's role. So, for example, if we follow an idea of connecting a product's guarantee to a product's expected lifespan, the, which, the, the lifespan which will have been defined by the, by, sorry, by the manufacturer um, you know, an, uh, um, at the beginning of the value chain, then it seems very important to for the SME to be able to be protected in case it is the manufacturer's fault that they claimed, you know, they claimed the lifespan was longer than actually was uh, seen by the consumer. And so the consumer will then turn back, obviously, to their sellers, which might be in that case an SME. So it seems important that the SME in turn may also turn against um, the actor in the value chain that's truly responsible for providing that information, for providing these characteristics of the product. So we can imagine uh, a lot of solutions. We know that in general, SMEs being small, they have little capacity to engage in big legal conflicts with big manufacturers. So some ideas that might be explored might be around B2B uh, mediators, um, you know, uh, solutions that will enable them again to to really play their their role uh, in the value chain. Uh, another idea uh, that we wanted to mention has to do with uh, refurbished items. Currently, there is no 
a real definition of what a, a refurbished item is. There's no legal definition, at least. It's considered a second-hand item because it's not new. Uh, but still, it's it's a bit more than you know any type of second-hand item. And we've seen various um, claims develop on the market uh, related to refurbished uh, products. Some that attach sort of a commercial guarantee to it, but there's nothing. There's no um, level playing field to use a very uh, overused <laughs> um, uh, formula, right? Uh, but so we think there might be value in. Um, and setting that field um, equally at the level of law um, for refurbished products, because that will again enable consumers maybe also to gain more trust in the in this new offer of refurbished items, uh, and in turn will help grow this this more uh, sustainable way uh, of trade. Um, and then maybe a last um, idea, which uh, we know is also close to the heart of e-commerce Europe. Um, is, uh, and has been mentioned before, it's what is around waste, um, waste management uh, for SMEs. What, right now, what we see is that the waste management framework is not very harmonized, in particular, everything that has to do with uh, extended producer responsibility obligations. Uh, currently, an SME that sells into, um, let's say, 10 member states would have to register for EPR in each of these member states and pay the associated fees, which will not be calculated the same way. The reporting requirements may not be the same. And so this is a real obstacle for SMEs to, um, to seize the opportunities of the single market uh, at the moment. And at the same time, we, we know that there is currently a challenge in, especially for the um, extended producer responsibility schemes, to gather the, the, the financial resources that they need to gather to finance the end of life of the products, which is obviously a perfectly legitimate objective. Uh, but if we want SMEs to participate more in that, especially SMEs that are online and reaching many markets at, at once, then we need to provide them uh, with a more harmonized and simplified uh, framework. So yes, yeah, so those are just a few ideas to uh, maybe advance a more, uh, again, favorable framework for SMEs online um, to uh, foster more um, sustainable ways of trade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, for sharing the, the business perspective of eBay on this. Uh, I would like to hand over the floor to Christoph uh, for uh, uh, the last uh, speech from uh, the German e-commerce association, BVH. So Christoph, what can you tell us from, uh, from an association of e-commerce perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks to you all. And it's really a pleasure for me to join this discussion. It doesn't happen very often that we have a political discussion and we all have the same goals and the same aims. I think the difference is in the way how we want to reach this. And there I do have to add some things from my perspective, my personal perspective, my perspective as vice president of e-commerce Europe for sustainability and for BEBH, the German e-commerce association. Well, first of all, I think um, we have to find a new style of making law, of legislation, um, policy making. What do I mean? I mean that we often work with prohib prohibition and with nudging and that we try to force people to do the right thing. I think we have to find more solutions where we do reward innovative um, solutions. I think we have to incentive what we need for the future in the field of sustainability. It's easier for the people of Europe to follow a law which enforces them to do something than just to prohibit things. That's one point for me. Another very important point is um, the point that we need um, an enforcement which is all over Europe the same. We do have European law, but the enforcement is very different from country to country. So sometimes we in Germany um, think of ourselves as the masters of enforcing European law, and we do much more than is requested. And I think it would be fine if we do always think about how we can enforce the European law in all the European countries. 
they are still different and we have to work on the equality of these European countries. But as long as we are where we are, we have to have a look at the same enforcement all over Europe. Um, and then I think the point is that we need to reduce the administrative burdens in the European Union. Um, for example, we have to apply for forms, we have to find solutions for each country and everything is different and we have to harmonize all the things we have to um, accept in the field of sustainability. For example, I mean in France, there's a law about furniture. If you want to give back furniture, used furniture, it's very complicated. We do not have such a law in Germany, but we have a law. You have to register at the packaging register. If you want to sell goods online, you have to register at the electronic waste register. And all these forms are mostly available in German, maybe in English, but there are so many small burdens and we have to find more European thinking in this. Um, another point is sometimes, well, Europe has not the opportunity to change everything. Um, the European Union just can work in the field where they have the right to do so. For example, tax matters are not a European matter. But the VAT directive, for example, we in Germany have an initiative started um, and it's called um, that we want the people to donate things and do not waste the things. For example, in e-commerce, we do have returns and sometimes in a very small portion, these returns have to be um, wasted. Why? Because they don't comply with all the needs of the European Union anymore or they are broken, but sometimes they are reusable. In Germany, you have to pay VAT if you want to donate such things. And the VAT directive does not offer an opportunity to reduce these, this VAT to zero. And this could be a field for the European Union in the future. Um, as far as I know, there is already existing um, a kind of draft for a new VIT directive with this opportunity. And this could be done by the European Union, for example. Um, and the last point for me is that we have to incentive innovation. We, as the e-commerce industry, we are on the driver's seat and we have a lighthouse function, as I already said in the other panel. And I think we have to work with innovation and innovation should be driven by us as the e-commerce industry, but had to, has to be incentive. Um, what I mean is we don't have always to look back how, for example, commerce worked in the last centuries. We have to look forward how we can change it to seamless commerce, for example. And e-commerce is not only selling goods to the customer, it is the whole supply chain. And that's important for us to, to keep an eye on the whole supply chain and to give incentive to digitalize your business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph, uh, for your insights as well. Um, I cannot see any questions from the audience for now, so I will just go on and, and uh, ask a question myself, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, I would like to pick up on something that Charlotte mentioned before, uh, which is uh, some sort of redress uh, for SMEs towards producers of goods. So something that would be important in terms of protection uh, for, for SMEs, which would be you know, the weak party in this kind of transaction. So I was wondering what the policymakers think about this kind of redress. Uh, maybe uh, the commission has uh, some, some ideas or Ms. Bacalari might have also some, uh, some insights on that. I don't know who wants to start. The first one that is unmuting me. Exactly. Can you ask the question again, please? Of course. Yeah, what I was saying is the point that uh, Charlotte mentioned before, uh, which is important to have some sort of redress for SMEs towards producers of goods in case uh, something goes wrong in terms of uh, sustainability claims or legal warranty or, or commercial warranty of products that are you know, going beyond what the current legal warranty is. So how can we ensure that, uh, uh, that SMEs are protected towards these kind of producers. And so is, there, is this something that is, uh, is important for you as policymakers? Is this something that you would like to support maybe? I don't know if it is a bit more clear. 
Well, uh, I will maybe start uh, because uh, indeed in uh, uh, this is something that is very important because it uh, uh, refers to what, what I was mentioning, this all kind of reverse logistics, because it's not only about, uh, uh, let's say, the immediate returns of the products of the packaging, but also uh, all the after sales care uh, that is necessary in order to ensure that if uh, we insist that our product should be durable, repairable, that we also in case they are not that they are proper mechanisms for consumers to exercise their rights and i must say that uh, um, actually when we were presenting the circular economy action plan which was uh, in march what immediately made it, we are a little bit nervous because at that moment the coronavirus crisis was really the, uh, the raging across uh, europe it was starting and we were quite nervous how it would be actually accepted but it was accepted with uh, it was very much welcome both by business and by consumers and what immediately made it to the headlines was this right to repair so that actually consumers would have the right to uh, uh, the, 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 the first that the products are repairable and then that uh, actually they could exercise this uh, we are of course now starting all the processes in order to see how to translate this in uh, uh, in uh, in policy initiatives uh, and um, we have, we have some ideas and also the circular economy action plan there mentions the role of guarantees and uh, uh, we know that the directive was uh, is from 2019 so we just have to see first I mean of course how it's implemented and, and adopted but uh, I think that this is a specific question that requires a bit of further analysis because we have to see how this happens currently with the two-year guarantee period and uh, indeed if this is prolonged even I mean that longer to fit uh, uh, more the life, the life uh, um, uh, time of a, of a, of a project of product, sorry, uh, what what could be the indeed the implications? So uh, I think that we have first to start with seeing what is the current uh, to to indeed uh, to ensure that. Um, uh, 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 that such situations where indeed there is an SME which is an intermediary between uh, a producer and the consumer uh, can uh, can actually um, uh, takes its responsibility or, or that this responsibility is shared in a way. For instance, in waste, uh, we have uh, the extender producer responsibility schemes where every producer contributes uh, to a scheme to deal with the waste so it's not the sme itself uh, that sells the product that has to deal with the it can contribute to a scheme so whether such solutions can be for instance explored uh, of shared responsibility to other uh, uh, areas than waste it's an interesting question but uh, here i'm a bit thinking out loud of course because all this is still uh, uh, in uh, in policy development uh, but that any specific uh, issues or solutions that you have identified uh, uh, could be very much welcome in, in this regard thanks thank you very much i don't know if anybody else would like to to react react on that Otherwise... maybe just one reaction on um, extend producer responsibility um, just to mention that uh, we've seen so indeed in, in the first target of this legislation is the producers right but with the forms of commerce that we have nowadays thanks to e-commerce uh, we see smes reaching customers in other member states than their own in which case they can be considered a producer of that product in the market that they sell because they are the first person to introduce the, the product on the, that national market. And I think this is where the, the challenge is practically, is that you can end up with a very small company that has sold just one product even to a customer, say, I don't know, a Spanish um, um, a seller of coffee machines has, sent, has sold one coffee machine to a French uh, customer, and suddenly they can become liable for um, EPR obligations in France um, uh, and in a sense you know everybody should participate as, as we all know that coffee maker will have an end of life and that should be paid for um, by someone but I think I think this is where um, the challenge is it's just making sure that we have um, we, we take into account those new profiles of global exporters that can be 
thanks to the internet, right, they can be very small companies. And that's true also for, for the um, responsibility uh, point of, of the different elements in the value chain that you just uh, talked about. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Yeah, I think you uh, exactly touched to the point that was, uh, that I was trying to, uh, to, to, to raise, uh, which is how do we allocate uh, exactly the responsibilities and the obligations to the different various actors in the value chain. So that's an important point also for us, because at the end we want something that is proportionate, something that is affordable. Ms. Kokalari, I think you want to come in. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add the fact that it's very important that uh, the laws uh, that, that are presented have the right uh, effect that the intention is uh, correct because everybody wants to do you know we all want to have more durable products the right to repair uh, uh, but the, the problem is that some legislation can have a bad impact for example if we impose that it uh, that the legal guarantees has to be uh, imposed on second-hand products then suddenly the small charity shop, second-hand uh, shops, will be uh, will have the whole burden of a legal guarantee, and I think the result of that will be that we will not have any second-hand shops in Europe or charity shops. So that's why I really welcome the the circular economy action plan. I'm really looking forward to the legislation that will come, but I'm also afraid that many of my colleagues in the European Parliament do not understand the consequences that some of the legislation that they want to impose can have on sustainability, on better sustainable behavior. So I really want to urge to Rosalina and to the Commission that now when you do, uh, when you will propose legislation that all of them have an impact assessment, studies, and are proven to be legislation that will have a good effect on the climate, not only a political greenwashing, you understand? Uh, so um, when it comes to the legal guarantee, I mean, I have colleagues in the house that want to uh, revise the sales of good agreement tomorrow, and it's, uh, it's a directive that hasn't even come into force yet. And I said to them, OK, but let's wait until 2024. Then when we know that the revision will be, then we can have a look again. Because if we have a culture in the European Union where we regulate, over-regulate on top of each other, then no legislation will come into force if we suddenly all the time have to uh, revise them every year and before they have been come into force. So enforcement is really, really crucial in this. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to comment on what you just said uh, regarding the legal guarantee period and the sales of goods directive. Uh, E-commerce Europe was one of the first advocates of uh, you know, having the same rules across Europe. I heard many times the single market being mentioned today uh, during our event. And, and the problem is that we, we still lack full harmonization. So if you take the legal guarantee period, this is just minimally harmonized across Europe, even with the sales of goods directive member states can go beyond if they want. So it's only two years of legal guarantee period that is a minimum harmonization. So we can still go beyond if we want, which means that we still don't have the same rules uh, across Europe. And this is something that is quite important for SMEs to be able to, to go cross border, I think, because as far as the, the rules will not be fully harmonized, I think it will be complicated for them to, to go cross border. And here I'm just focusing on the legal guarantee period, but you all mentioned uh, various other areas that need uh, further harmonization, also EPR and so on and so on. Um, I see a question from, uh, from the audience, uh, from uh, the Dutch E-commerce Association of Ice Cream Co. Uh, I will read it out loud for you. Uh, in both panels, harmonized labeling was mentioned as important for better communication towards consumers and sharing information within the supply chain. Are there any ideas on who or what institution should issue and verify such a harmonized label? Difficult one, maybe. <laughs> who would like to comment on that? 
I, I can maybe start. Uh, first of all, I mean that indeed uh, providing reliable information to, to consumers is, is uh, very important. Uh, it's also important that uh, we provide it in a way that consumers are actually uh, likely to read it. Uh, and uh, uh, also it's likely that their behavior is influenced uh, by it. So as a first step, uh, what uh, we will do under the Circular Economy Action Plan is uh, uh, to ensure that any green claims are based on a sound methodology because uh, we see instance there are more and more green, green claims and uh, sometimes it's not exactly clear what, uh, what methodology they're based in, but this is indeed very theoretical. It's not about because many of the things that uh, were were touched upon is, is actually how the label should be displayed, uh, what should be displayed, and so on and so forth. I really uh, think that indeed uh, we have to see with with the growth in uh, e-commerce, how information is, is displayed online, because now a lot of the thinking uh, has been done on physical products, and uh, this is an area which which is cross-cutting, I think, because it's uh, not only the, the environmental information; it's still it's uh, it, it's nascency. So, uh, uh, but there is a lot of other information, and I think that whenever we are looking on how to provide environmental information, we will see also uh, how this is done in other areas be it uh, nutritional values, health information, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is a very interesting area. I, I cannot say a lot about it because there are many things that have to go on a label, not only environmental information, but definitely a very uh, interesting area to focus on. At the same time, we are also very much aware that there are limits uh, to influencing consumer behavior. Year, and uh, that's why also one of our main preoccupations will be to uh, make all products sustainable so that whatever is placed on the market is actually sustainable because uh, it would be, in my opinion, uh, we cannot burden the consumer who has to make many choices in a day and, and uh, sometimes uh, we have, let's say, one hour to, to do our shopping for a whole week that you would go into every single product and uh, that's why, first of all, it, it's important that we have unified, clear information and uh, and, and also that uh, we focus enough effort on, on actually making all products uh, sustainable. Thanks. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No, okay. I wanted to make. Just I just want to say that I totally agree with uh, Rosalina. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment building on uh, what Rosalina just said, but also something that uh, Christoph um, mentioned earlier about focusing on incentives um, first of all, right, and rather than uh, limitations. I mean, we've. Also, uh, been reading or hearing about um, ideas to limit the right of uh, free returns, for example, or the home the the option for home delivery. And I just think that such ideas are, you know, in the category of uh, what Ms. Kohlari also mentioned earlier, which is ideas which kind of sound good politically, but then their impact is not fully measured. For example, um, it, it is important to realize that if you limit the right to free returns or to home delivery, you may make e-commerce um, harder to reach um, remote areas, rural areas may be put at a disadvantage because you don't have so many uh, options for collection points or, well, you have to take your car and then drive a long time. So what's the environmental impact of that, right? And so focusing on positive incentives towards driving better consumer habits and choices, as Rosalina mentions, um, seems, seems important in that regard, rather than, in, you know, imposing uh, more restrictions. Christo? Thank you, Charlotte, for the support. Um, something to add from my side, and that's, I think we are already much further than other, other industries. E-commerce is really a lighthouse for other um, industries. We are on the way to a complete change. The change is that we are request-based and not offering economy. And that's something which is very important in the field of sustainability as well. And so please have in mind that we are not responsible at the 
e-commerce industry for all the bad things which are happening now. There are many others who have to do their homework and we are already doing this. That's something I want to add because um, I think we're nearly over the time. So please, we do our homework, we do it because we want to do it and it's in our genes to do it because e-commerce is characterized by effectiveness and that's something which is good for the environment and for the people as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph, for these final words. Uh, it's almost the end of our webinar, so if you don't mind, I would like to uh, make some, some final remarks and some final conclusions. Uh, I would like first to, to thank all our speakers, of course, for their great discussion today, for the great contributions, and all the participants uh, for your questions and for having followed us. We hope that today's event gave you a first taste uh, of all the fruitful exchange to come on uh, on this very important issue in Brussels, but not only in Brussels, Brussels also in the, the various EU capitals. Uh, I, I think this webinar is also giving an opportunity for a call for an action uh, in favor of a, a green and digital recovery post uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen today that the e-commerce industry has indeed the tools uh, to contribute to such an economic recovery and e-commerce Europe aims to continue to be an active stakeholder in these discussions uh, at European level, also by connecting various stakeholders from the supply chain and act as a platform as we tried to do today. So I would really thank you again, um, all of you for, uh, for your contributions and do not hesitate to reach out to e-commerce Europe for uh, any questions or remarks. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye.